when you become a Blue Angel, now you got to up your game 300%. We as a team and organization are going to prove our performance 300% and you got three months to do it in because that's the training cycle of a Blue Angel, which we can go in later. So it's this constant state in our, our brains, we think in frames anyhow, of opening up and focusing down. And you can do that 65 times a second. Um, and once you get really skilled at that, that allows you to maintain the focus and situational awareness that I think is critical, not just for the high-performance athlete, but it's critical in business, it's critical in life. It's not just about individual mastery. It's more important about the team mastery. We stand today. The Business Method. The business with method. a shout-out. The Business Method. The Business Method Podcast. The Business Method Podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and welcome to the Business Method Podcast, a podcast featuring successful entrepreneurs and high-profile people dissecting their business models. We dissect the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. On our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that have built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that produce over a million dollars and annual revenue and now we're interviewing 100 major influencers to get behind the minds and the science of using influence to grow business and influence income results economies and cultures there's a growing number of people building these caliber of businesses like this and we're going to figure out what it takes to make this happen now let's jump in today's show the business method could you imagine flying a fighter jet at a thousand miles per hour or flying that same jet upside down only three feet away from another jet going just as fast as you are? To operate at this level, you need an incredible amount of training to become one of the best jet pilots on the planet, and today's guest is one of them. John Foley is our guest today, and John is a retired Blue Angel pilot for the Navy. The Blues, as they're called, are known as the absolute best jet pilots on the earth. To perform at this level, it takes a lot of focus and hard work, and much of his training has helped him transfer into the high-performing entrepreneur and public speaker that he is today. Today on the show, John shares about his experience as a Blue Angel fighter pilot. He shares with us about the experience of dogfighting in the air at lightning speed. He talks about what it's like flying a thousand miles per hour, the scariest flight he's ever made, almost leading to disaster and how he mastered his thoughts and emotions to get behind the pilot seat the very next day. As you can imagine, it takes an intense high performance mentality to operate at this level. So we also asked John about focus, meditation, visualization, flow states, and how to master your mindset for success. And lastly, John shares about applying this business and having a professional speaking career. Without further ado, you guys, let's welcome John Foley to the show. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics. Listeners, welcome to the podcast today, and I'm really, really excited for our guest. John Foley is his name, and he is a former Blue Angel Air Force pilot, but also on top of that, he's a high performer, professional speaker, amazing entrepreneur, and it's been a while that I've really wanted to get a special high-performing military person on the podcast and John came across our platform and, and we wanted to get him on the show now something that is that stands out for me you know there's 4,000 people that scale the summit of Mount Everest and recently there's a picture online of um, a backup like a traffic jam on Mount Everest because there's so many people going there these days 2,400 or so active Navy, Navy SEALs 536 astronauts that have been to outer space and since 1946 there's only been 257 pilots that have flown for the blue angels and we have one of them on the show john foley welcome to the podcast how you doing my friend chris nice to meet you thank you for having me i'm, I'm glad to be here and those words glad to be here meant something very special to me when i was a blue angel and i think by the end of this podcast they will mean something significant to your audience hey just a, a quick heads up though blue angels are navy by the way 
uh, the, what did I say? Air Force is Thunderbirds. You said Air Force. No big deal. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, no, you yeah. know, you learn something new every day. You know, I was shocked when I actually learned that um, the Navy was part of the Marines. And my dad told me that when I was in my 30s. And I and, and my mom and I argued with him. We said, yeah, you're, you're crazy. And he goes, no, the, 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 is that right? The Navy's, no, the Marines are part of the Navy. Did yeah, I get that right? <laughs> the Marines that's are it. actually under the Department of the Navy. But let me tell yeah. you, if there's any Marines listening to this, they're going no way because the Marines have their own culture and they really do. <laughs> um, uh, it's only under their Navy when it comes to funding Paychecks. budgets. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. How cool. Okay. So, so make sure I got it right. The Blue Angels are part of the Navy, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Got Navy it. carrier fighter pilots. That's where we Interesting. Yeah. yeah. How cool. So, um, I want to talk more about the Blue Angels and the history um, of them and then the mindset you got from this and the career that you have today because there's a lot of overlapping on, I think, on what you do and what um, I do and, and plenty of the listeners um, want to or aspire to do. But I, I'm glad, you know, I love when I hop on the show, John, and I can tell almost immediately I'm going to like this person. And I did that with, you know, when we just hopped on um, on our call just a few minutes ago, you had a big smile on your face. You were wrapping up a team call and I was listening in for a few minutes. And <laughs> and it seemed like you had a really happy team and things are going well. And uh, like, I think we're going to have a great conversation. First off though, you know, I don't know too much about your backstory. So if, where'd you grow up? You know, all over, all over the U S cause my dad was in the army and when you're in okay. the military, you move about every three years. I was actually born in Germany, uh, lived a lot on the East coast. My dad was a, uh, an instructor at West point. He was a army engineer, I lived in Virginia, DC, Texas, Florida, but I pretty much grew up in California, went to high school in California and went to school in Colorado for a year, went to Naval Academy, and then bam, I'm off on my, my Navy career. Did you know from a young age that you wanted to be in the military or? You know, did... it was even more specific than that. Um, when I was 12, my dad took me to an air show. Uh, now I love my dad. I mean, he was like this icon to me. I mean, if when I think about wisdom, I just think mm -hmm. about my dad. And uh, so I wanted to grow up just like him. Well, he happened to be an engineer and an army officer. So that's what I thought I was going to be. And then one day he took me to an air show. I'll never forget this day. We're in Newport, Rhode Island. I'm 12 years old. I look up in the sky. There's six magnificent blue jets flying that day. And I turned to my dad. I said, dad, I'm going to do that. And I remember something hit in my heart. You know, when you, when you feel something, <laughs> it's not just in your head, but in your yeah. heart. That was that moment. 18 years later, I got to strap in on one of those cockpits. Wow. What was it like at that moment when you strapped in for the very first time? Well, a, a couple of feelings. First was just awe, you know, and, and that's when I speak to, um, and I'll speak to over a thousand audiences in the last decade. Uh, I always ask people, you know, when you think of the Blue Angels, what comes to mind? And the first word is usually amazing, awe, something like that. And that's what I felt. I mean, I, I was also extremely humbled to be in the presence of greatness, to be honest with you. These, these, it was unbelievable, the level of execution, precision, teamwork that was on display there every single day. So when I climbed in the cockpit, it was an air show, but I was in the back seat of a two-seat jet. Now, you got to put this in perspective. I've already, uh, a Navy fighter pilot, flew in the movie Top Gun, six-time top 10 carrier pilot, instructor pilot with the Marines, um, and all of a sudden now I'm in the blues. And it's a whole new game. And we're taxiing out to the runway. The little hairs are standing up on my neck. I mean, nice. I'm like, holy crap. And uh, we can talk later about uh, the first takeoff, but it blew my mind. <laughs> I could imagine. So I, I've re I mentioned before we hit the record button that I've read probably a dozen Navy SEAL or um, special op books just because I was so at this point in time in my life, I was just soaking up the mentalities, the way that people think as these high performers, um, the missions that they go into, the brotherhood that they create. Um, and so we know with the Navy SEALs, you know, that's a big buzzword today. Every Navy SEAL's got a new movie coming out every few months, right? And uh, they're getting a lot of media for sure. But they go to BUDS training, right? They go to basic training. Then if they pass and they get, they can get recommended and, and go to BUDS training, which is really the, the most difficult training that is known that is out there for, for soldiers. 
And then once they pass buds, then they have another two years or so that they have to train before I think they even find active duty, right? Is that is that correct or something along those lines? No, they're in active duty, but it's before they get deployed on deployed. An, an active um, SEAL team. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what it's what is it like? You know, there's even fewer Blue Angels. What is it like? The process. Tell, actually, tell us first, uh, what is a Blue Angel? Why did the military create them? And then the process of becoming a Blue Angel. What is that? Yeah, absolutely. So the Blue Angels have been in existence since 1946. Chester Nimitz uh, got tasked or asked a guy named Butch Voris to um, start it, uh, take dogfighting, which is done really high up in the sky, right? Bring right. it low to the ground. And the reason they did that was they're trying for recruiting and retention. So first off, the Blue Angels, we call ourselves ambassadors of goodwill. And that's really our higher purpose. And it's one of the key, I think, in any entrepreneur, any high performer, uh, my belief is you need to have a purpose larger than yourself. And so mm-hmm. for every single member of the Blue Angels, not just the pilots, uh, it's about being an ambassador. Uh, I took the team to Moscow in 1992, first time it's ever been done, never been done since, flew against the Russians, with the Russians. There's so many stories we can talk about, but it's all about uh, this recruiting, retention. But I think it's more than that. It's about in- inspiration and it- it's about creating awe in people and inspiring. When I go to the crowd line and sign autographs for kids, it, it I never forget the look in their eyes because what you really had ability to do was inspire someone else to be great at something. I personally didn't care if they joined the military, just be great at something and enjoy what you do. So that's the mission of the blues. Uh, We're the oldest flight demonstration quadrant. Uh, Every year we get better. And that's part of the continuous improvement process that um, I talk about in my book. Uh, It's, there's a definite process and a mindset to what you're seeing up there. Uh, It's repeatable. It's transferable. It works in business and it works in life, but there's some keys. There's really some secret sauces um, that to make that, that happened. So that's why the blues exist. I'll never forget in 92, when I was taking the team to Moscow, I had a chance to meet Butch Forrest and he was the original founder. 1946 was a, you know, an ace back in world war II. And he said to me, he goes, Gucci, by the way, Gucci's my call sign, all fighter pilots. (laughs) I don't like it by the way. That's why it's stuck. But anyhow, um, the, uh, he said, you know, back when we started, we were the best in the world. He says today, you guys are the best in the world. And then he said this, and next year, next year's team will be even better than you. And that's the culture of the Blue Angels. Can you, can you tell the listeners, John, what dogfighting is? Because I don't know if a lot of people still know what it is. <laughs> oh, good. So um, I don't know. You know, Top Gun was out a while ago. We're making yeah. Top Gun 2. It's going to be out here real soon. Um, but that kind of gave a good – people who saw that uh, get a sense of – it's air-to-air combat. It's uh, We call it dogfighting. Uh, and it's usually uh, – you know, flying jets against other jets, uh, and you, uh, we call it no points for second place. I mean, there's missiles, there's guns, and you get into a, a, a dogfight, meaning the jets are, are pulling as hard as you can, and, and there's different techniques on this, uh, but trying to get into a position to shoot somebody else. And uh, there's always a winner and a loser. It happens pretty quick, to be honest with you. Uh, but there's a lot of training that goes into that. So typically, it's done up at high altitude, And what we do on the blues is we take those maneuvers and we bring them low to the ground and, uh, and we do them in a way that's more artful, more ballet, but also high performance. You know, Thumper and I, we were the solo pilots. We'd come at each other at a thousand miles per hour closer across within a wingspan. You'd be so close. My head would get thumped from the airflow going over the canopy. You know, a thousand miles per hour closer, that's a mile every four and a half seconds. We're approaching each other. So stuff happens pretty fast and it's pretty grueling up there. Wow. So uh, how often is dogfighting happening in today's world? Well, not that often because we're so damn good at it. I mean, uh, (laughs) you know, that's one thing, you you know, the U.S. is incredible with our not only the aircraft, but more importantly, the training of the pilots. And that's what makes a difference. There's a lot of good aircraft out there. Uh, And uh, it's very rare now uh, because and that's good because we're not in a bunch of conflicts. We own the airspace, uh, owned it over Iraq, o- owned it uh, pretty much Afghanistan, you know it. Uh, no country's been able to really challenge the dominance we have up there in the sky. And so I, you know, what I picture, when I picture dogfights, I think of the old 
World War II movies or World yeah. War One movies when, you know, the Germans or the British are flying in the, the, the biplanes, right? And they're trying to do the loops and they have the machine yeah. gun and then the guy's like, oh, no, I don't have any ammo. And he's yeah. trying to, you know, save his own life. And so how many have you been in many dogfights? Well, we practice them all the time. So the answer yeah. is, of course, and uh, not in uh, real combat. I've got, you know, um, actually green ink, which we call combat time. Uh, but very r rarely do you actually um, get engaged. Uh, the one time that I was involved was in 1988. We were, the Straits of Hamoose were being mined by Iran, if you remember back then. And we were escorting Kuwaiti tankers through and, so, you know, protecting them. And, uh, you know, uh, we had an op opportunity there where um, some Iranian jets were coming out, they turned around and they ran. So the answer is no. But the uh, but you practice it all the time. That's why Top Gun exists. Um, you know, Top Gun is a school, and uh, and also in the Navy Marines we have what we call replacement air groups. And you train dogfighting, you teach dogfighting uh, all the time, and it's a skill that's perishable. So you have to really um, be on your game. It's both a mental and a physical game. And it's the exact same thing as happens in a Blue Angel Air Show. You know, um, in the, in my book and, and in the speeches I give, I take you behind the scenes and I show you how, number one, we prepare and how we focus. Because you got to be focused even before you get up there, visualization, that kind of stuff. Um, then you actually have a very dynamic world in front of you, high speed, a lot of stuff going on, like any entrepreneur, by the way, tons mm -hmm. of connections back. And then uh, the biggest aha, one of the big things I want readers to hopefully get out of this is the debrief. Uh, we go into a very extensive debriefing process. And while the words debrief aren't new, uh, the way we did it was significantly different. We called it a glad to be here debrief. And it, it can change, can change uh, entrepreneurs. They'll scale your business quicker than anything else. Uh, it's We're changing healthcare with this. I'm working with the top uh, health systems in the world uh, because it, it's the game changer that not only helps you improve errors, which that's that's obvious, that happens quickly. There's a bigger benefit for what I try to teach, and that is it builds chemistry, camaraderie, teamwork, leadership. All these big words that we like to talk about are done through this very powerful tool called the Glad to Be Here Debrief. I want to talk more about that definitely, but let's let's stay on um, the Blue Angels and, and yeah. some of the things you learned from that. Uh, be, but I know that's that's a really good thought, and I'm sure it's very effective because us entrepreneurs so often we just move on to the next thing without really doing a proper debrief of whatever happened, figuring out what our successes and failures were, and where we went wrong, what we did right. And so um, I could see the advantage of that. When when you're flying, so I mentioned before the show also to you, I grew up in Kansas City and you guys yeah. trained on a military base outside. And I actually um, saw you guys fly when I was a kid because, um, you know, we went out with Boy Scouts to see yeah. um, the, the Blue Angels. And, and I just remember how fast you guys would go, but also the amazing stunts that you would do as well. And you said you're flying, like literally, so this is what I remember, two – two jets flying and you said upwards around a thousand miles per hour and one is um, flat its belly is flat to the ground and the other one is completely upside down yep. but the the heads i guess you call that the heads or the windshield of the jet the cockpit, uh, you, cannabis. yeah the cockpit right but the the glass you guys are really just flying on top of each other and one guy's upside down yep. and you're you're flying that fast how in the world can you make that happen? Like that just so, seems so crazy to me. And it, it's just like the smallest error could could be it for both of you guys, right? Yeah. And so how, what's the process of, of flying at that intense speed without any faults? Yeah, I love it. Well, first off, rarely do you have any um, – you're never perfect. We're, we're just – we minimize – the discrepancies and uh, we're constantly moving but within a three inch circle normally so you can imagine flying uh, next to someone at and by the way it's a thousand miles per hour closure we're going about five six hundred miles per hour when we're together uh, okay. is is about uh, normally we fly around three feet apart 18 inches uh, but I keep my airplane within three inch circle on the other person's jet. That's really hard to do when you're upside down and moving through dynamic stuff like that. So the answer to your question is there is a process to that um, and it's training. But even before you get to that point, 
because what I'm about to talk about is what is in the 0.01%. You know, when I work with companies, I talk about entrepreneurs, you talk about, well, you know, how do you get to become the best, right? So the, the 1% of the world, whatever. But I talk about what's it like in the, in the one tenth of one tenth of 1%. Because what we're showing you on the Blue Angels is an extreme level of high precision, okay? Uh, but here's the cool part is um, it's, 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 possible and more than possible you see it every year so my kind of passion's been for the last 20 years is let's break down what worked in that dynamic environment and see how we can apply it in people's normal lives so i think the way to answer that question is really twofold maybe i can go into um first off you you asked earlier you know what does it take to become a blue angel and i, I can go over that if you want and then yeah. the second part is when you become a blue angel now you got to up your game 300 percent, and that's that's the real uh, magic that happens. So, um, do you want me to start on any of those questions? Yeah, let's go back to the process yeah. of becoming a, a blue angel. Yeah, yeah. So here's here's the work. So you explain how you know Navy SEAL works. Very similar. Uh, you're looking at trying to to um, define uh, the best of the best, right? And uh, so a Navy pilot, you know, you get, you got to finish. Uh, the Naval Academy or any school, right? And you get, uh, if, if you get selected to become a, a pilot, that's your first job. And then what happens is it takes about two years. So um, two years to train someone and you start in slow moving well, simulators, then you go slow moving airplanes called T-34s, then you get into uh, intermediate jet training, then you go to advanced jet training. And for me, that was, you know, Pensacola, Florida, Beeville, Texas, I'm flying A-4s. You get uh, in the Navy, you get to land jets on and off aircraft carriers, blows your mind, by the way. That's mm -hmm. some of the most challenging flying in the world, especially trying to land a jet on a carrier at night, which you don't do as a student, okay? That's, uh, you just do daytime. Time, but it takes two years and then you get what you call your wings and that's what we call naval aviators and that's when they actually pin your wings on you and that's a cool moment in your life um, it's, it's a big ceremony uh, you've worked hard at that well now guess what now the game just starts okay that's two years of training thousands of hours to, well um, you know you can imagine how much time it takes to uh, the briefs and debriefs and flying and now you get assigned to your fleet squadron. But before you get there, you have to get proficient at a certain type of airplane. So maybe you'll pick fighters, maybe attacks, maybe a support aircraft. And usually the best, and it's a pecking order. They go to the number one person, you're graded every single day when you're flying. And at the end of the, uh, when you get your wings, they go to the number one person, they say, what airplane would you like to fly? And if it's available, that person gets to pick. And then from there on, you know, you get what's left over. So most people will, will pick fighters. Uh, if you, it doesn't really matter what once, what, if you get into fighters or anything else, you then go to what they call a replacement air group. And that's where they train you how to fight the airplane. At this point you can fly, but now you gotta, you gotta learn the weapon systems and doing the dogfight and things that we talked about. That takes about another year. So it takes about three years to get to the point where you're actually of any value to the Navy mm -hmm. or anybody else. And then you get assigned to your squadron and it's a three year tour. And on the Navy, you get deployed. You fly on jets, on and off aircraft carriers, flown all around the world. Um, I've been to almost every sea in the, in the world. I've been around the world multiple times, uh, just all, all kinds of incredible experiences. Then what happens after that tour and that if you, if you survive it, not everybody does, if you <laughs> survive it, um, then they usually, uh, take the best of those pilots and they become instructor pilots. So you may have saw in the movie Top Gun, you know, they're talking about the Top Gun instructor pilots. There's replacement air group instructor pilots. And that's where, um, where most of the Blue Angels come from. So when you apply for the Blue Angel, what we're really looking for is we take people out of the instructor rank who have already demonstrated that they not only can fly the airplane incredibly well, here's what's more important, you can teach someone else. So you have to mm -hmm. be a mentor and a coach. And 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 you're you're like a player coach. You're up there flying, but you're also teaching and mentoring. Because we swap out half the team a year. You can imagine that half of your yeah. executive team knew every year, a third of my support team knew every year. So training and mentoring and coaching is huge uh, in the Blue Angels. And then from that group, uh, we'll take three pilots a year um, and they go through a long selection process. 
of uh, you know typical stuff in business, resumes, res recommendation. But more importantly, um, you get to meet the pilots. And we, it's almost like, um, remember the movie Animal House? Do you ever see that movie? <laughs> of course, yeah. Well, you know when they're when they're naming the the pledges, it's kind of the mm -hmm. same way. We have a meeting. We we bring the 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 selectees out to Pensacola. We spend about a week with them. Uh, they get to meet you know the significant significant others and talk to people. Bottom line is we vote. And it's the only thing in the Navy that I'm aware of, SEALs don't even do this, where the replacements are picked by the existing team. And um, nice. so the existing team, once you've met that criteria, instructor, pilot, all that kind of stuff, um, we pick our own replacements. What would you say, John, is the difference in mentality between a, a Blue Angel and even, you know, say some of the top, top best pilots in, in the military? Well, it's... Similar mentality uh, if you're talking some of the best pilots, right? But what's okay. different is your ability to focus and um, this ability of a belief and a teamwork. So the, the difference, I'll put it this way. When I um, showed up to the Blues, remember that first flight I was talking to you about? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had done some, some fun stuff in the Navy, right? Uh, and then the Blues, we take off. And we select full afterburner. That's 128,000 pounds of thrust, by the way, with the four jets on the runway. Next thing I know, we get airborne. The pilot does this violent left wing down. We go slicing underneath the wingtip of number two jet. We're tucked in underneath the afterburners of the boss. The airplane's shaking. The flames are coming out. And these guys, four guys, go straight up. Now, my eyes just opened up. <laughs> you know. And, and here's, here's the thought. It hit me, though, Chris. The thought mm -hmm. was, how am I going to do this? Because what the Blue Angels were, were doing – was and what they were saying to me was John Foley you want to play in this game you got to improve your performance 300 percent we as a team and organization are going to prove our performance 300 percent and you got three months to do it in because that's the training cycle of a blue angel which we can go in later um, but that's what it is so just to put it in uh, perspective is um, I needed up my game not just me personally but as a team member and that's why the message is so powerful the sports teams and organizations it's not just about individual mastery which absolutely is critical it's more important about the team mastery. I got to ask John a couple of things. What's it like? What's the world, you know, <laughs> what's the world like? And I'm sure you've asked, uh, answered this question a thousand times. What's the world like when you're going a thousand miles per hour in the sky? Like well, how long does that take to get from New York to LA? Well, first off, it's just flat cool, right? And, <laughs> yeah, I can uh, imagine. And yeah. you got it. That's one thing I used to pinch myself is, that it's just not normal, you know, it's mm -hmm. magical. Number one, airplanes shouldn't fly. Now, I've had all the, I'm an engineer, <laughs> I understand Bernoulli's law, I understand the curvature of the wing, I understand about lift, but I look out there and I go, this is crazy. It shouldn't mm -hmm. work, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, now the more thrust you have, the better. You know, we always, all pilots, fighter pilots, we just want more power, right? Uh, but to answer your question, um, it's, it's amazing to be up there. Now the difference is very, very clearly, going a thousand miles per hour up at altitude, it's just dials in your cockpit. Um, but when you're down low okay. to the ground, holy crap. You know, here, here's a way you can try to do it. Take your car, drive about, I don't know, as fast as you want to legally or whatever, you know, you want to do. Um, and look straight down at the dotted lines on the road. And when you look straight down, those dotted lines will be going by so fast. That's what it feels right. like going a thousand miles. That's what telephone poles feel like going by at a thousand miles per hour below the ground. Oh my God! How and how how far is that between New York and LA? How many hours? Well, is it an even yeah, hour? So it, it depends on your fuel. Here, here's the problem: uh, okay. when you're going that fast, you're burning up fuel, so you can't yeah. go the whole way. That's why airliners fly slow, to be honest with you, um, and they fly up high altitude because fuel efficiency. Um, okay. Now, you know, if you so the answer to your question is the way I would do it in a fighter jet is very similar to an airliner, unless I got airborne tanking. So if, uh, that's kind of nice to call up your buddies and say, hey, you got a, you got a tanker? Come on up over Kansas City and I'll meet you above uh, uh, at 20,000 feet and give me some gas and I'll keep going. That's kind of fun. When, what's an example of when the, the Blue Angels would be deployed in, in today's scenario? Well, the Blues actually have only been deployed once in the entire history, and that was in Korea. Uh, and okay. I don't think it would happen in today's scenario because the, the idea about deployments is um, all the Blue Angels are active duty, you know, instructor combat pilots, but we do a short tour, which is, uh, that's what this is called. In the Navy, you're either out at sea deployed 
or you're out at shore teaching or training somebody else. And so you get in a, okay. uh, a cycle. So the answer to your question is um, we don't just like when, it, when a conflict happens, you don't just say, oh, these are the best pilots, let's send them over. No, there's a, there's a rotation, right? Squadrons are, are working up and there are uh, people out over there. So uh, you just got to fit into that rotation. So it would have to be an extended conflict before you'd ever see that. Yeah, that makes sense. What was your scariest situation as as uh, flying <laughs> as a I've pilot? Had, <laughs> I've had a ton of them. I mean, it's funny now. It's it's flying in the backseat of airliners. To be honest with you, but it's not scary. It's <laughs> yeah. uh, it's actually so so safe, so calm. I mean, I I sleep. But what um what I basically did one day is I just started reflecting back and saying, well, you know, how many times did I almost die? That's that was the question I asked mm. myself, and uh, it was nine. So you know how they say <clears throat> that cats got nine lives. Well, I know so humans do too. At least I did, luckily. But three of them, I was so close to death that I could not even eject. And what that means is, you know, you can eject out of a jet airplane. You pull a handle, and it blows you out of the cockpit. But it takes about 1.2 seconds to activate that, and you have to be inside the the envelope, meaning you don't want to be upside down, 50 feet off the ground. You'd just be blown into the ground, right? So. Um, mm. Uh, I've had three instances where I could not even eject, um, and uh, and I survived, which are, is fortunate. <laughs> At least my wife thinks yeah. so. Yeah. yeah, I think so. <laughs> what can you do? You mind sharing about those? Instances? Yeah, yeah. So the first one um, that that I really remember is landing on the back of an aircraft carrier at night. So remember I was telling you about um, how challenging that is. You know, they actually, back in Vietnam, they hooked up naval aviators. They were measuring their heart rate, right? And they were trying to see mm -hmm. where were the most stressful moments. And these are guys that are flying combat over Vietnam, getting shot at by missiles. Well, you can imagine your, your heart rate goes up a little bit. Do you realize that the heart rate landing their airplane after a combat mission on the back of an aircraft carrier at night was higher than it was getting shot at? So that I, I, I believe it. Yeah. yeah. And we do this every day. There's guys out there doing it right now. So um, it's a challenge. I mean, you're basically coming down a flight path at three quarters of a mile. You may have heard this in Top Gun. You know, I say Maverick, call the ball. Uh, you're, you're, you're looking for this lens on the aircraft carrier. Here's the problem. Okay. The carrier, your landing area is moving away from you. It's moving away. It's a boat. So it's moving away mm -hmm. from you. It's actually an angled deck. It's moving away from you at an angle. Uh, it's a boat. You're on the water. Guess what? It's moving. Okay. It's pitching up yeah. and down. It's rolling. So your landing area is constantly moving. For you to, to get one of the wires, there's only four wires. They're actually cables. We call them wires. They're only 40 feet apart. All right. For you to land and your tail hook has to catch one of these. And you're landing at full power. So you're coming aboard about 160 miles per hour. Uh, if you cross the ramp of the carrier, if you're perfect, your tail hook misses that by 11.2 feet. Well, guess what? Half the time, the deck's pitching more than 11.2 feet, right? Mm -hmm. And you gotta you gotta land your 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 um, jet with inside those 40 feet of cables. So <laughs> to answer your question, uh, it it takes a lot of precision, a lot of training. Daytime becomes fun, but nighttime's never fun. I mean, it's it's you're just right on the edge, right? And so I'm coming down. It's my first tour. Call it they call us a nugget. That's like a rookie in the NFL. So I'm coming mm -hmm. down the chute. I got maybe 30 to 40 night carrier landings under my belt, which is not a lot, right? Um, if you get to 100, we call it Centurion. That's kind of cool. They give you a patch. But I'm coming down. the. Um, um, there's no bonuses in the Navy, by the way, like that. The only way mm -hmm. you um, reward people is with uh, patches, you know, like a top 10 carrier patch, or in this case, it's yeah. Centurion. It's amazing what people will do for a patch. But um, anyhow, uh, uh, and I'm coming down the chute. I'm actually doing fairly well at the time. I'm in the top 10 as a nugget, which is not – usually doesn't usually happen. And I'm, I'm grading myself, you know, because you get graded every pass. I'm going, oh, I got this thing nailed. Then what happens is this blood curling screen. The last, the next thing I see, because I'm looking out at this, this lens, this landing area, and it, got, it has gone from a center ball, which means you're okay, right, to a red right. ball flashing. Now, red ball flashing means you're going to land in what we call the spud lock. Spud locker is below the flight deck where they peel potatoes. That's why we call it spud locker, right? <laughs> okay. And okay. Um, and that means you know you got a one time landing. And and uh, and at this point, uh, there's you know there's going to be one big fireball. And all of a sudden, you know uh, the guy who's screaming is this LSO, this landing signal officer on the back of the boat, um, and he's just screaming power. So I go to full power. You know my training kicks in, but it's it's almost too late, right? And what's happened is I've settled like crazy. I'm coming down like a. Um, 
a ton of crap. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm a full power. I'm set the attitude. I'm inside the wave off window. There's what they call a burble. This was on the Enterprise, where it's a sinkhole right before you land. And uh, and now I'm long for the ride, you know. And mm-hmm. and I got to tell you, at this moment, I normally don't share this too often. Um, this energy leaves my body. This this I actually leave my body. I'm looking down at this situation because I've seen wow. the movies. And it's a beautiful fireball. I mean, it's a one-time landing, right? And uh, all of a sudden, I hit, and I don't blow up, which surprised me. And uh, next thing I know, the tail hook catches a cable. It takes about two seconds. And once once the tail hook caught the cable, this energy comes back in my body. Now I'm scared crapless. I'm dry heaving. I'm puking. My legs are shaking like crazy. <laughs> and I'm like uh-huh. going, holy crap, what was that? And I ended up missing the ramp by about nine inches that day. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. And did you have any injuries or were you okay? No, no, no. I mean, it's, it's it, was, it was okay. <laughs> it's just that yeah. that's a, you know, that's a normal landing that on the carrier. We, we used to joke around. Any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. Um, so no, no, it, there was no injuries. Now there's a mental thing you got to get over them. And that is, are you going to go out there and do that the next night? And the answer <laughs> right. is absolutely. You know, you get back on the horse. I went out the next night and you got to overcome fear. And that's something that I like to talk about um, in the book and some other things is, you know, how do you overcome fear? Uh, because you're going to go out there and you're going to have to do it again. What do you what do you do to prepare yourself? So yeah, you nice. nearly died. You had almost had a what a lot of people call out of body experience. Yeah, yeah. To, and and so the next day, you know, for me, I'm like, uh, just give me a month or so, you know, I've got to settle back in. <laughs> I've got to meditate on this for a while. Um, but you, you don't have that option. It's like go out the uh, next day. And of course you've got your team there yeah. that encourages this and help you through it. Uh, what do you do to tell yourself, okay, I've got to get out there and prepare yourself to make sure you're ready to fly again the next night. Great question. And I know you're kind of joking about, well, I'm going to wait for a month and meditate. It's uh, just the opposite. Okay. Um, we, actually debrief that moment and that's the key right so the the Mm -hmm. minute that i walked off that airplane i went down to my squadron no one wants to even talk to you because they realize you know that was pretty close uh and then the lso comes in and there's a team and uh, we do this always not just when there's a bad bad landing you do it every single time and you have an immediate debrief and here's the two things i want to know first thing i want to know is what did you see? See, when I was the, I was an LSO, I was an instructor. So I would never tell somebody what happened first. I would first mm-hmm. ask them, what did they see? Because see, what I want to know as an instructor is what is what's going through the other person's mind. Um, right. I and and so you know, I told them exactly what happened. I got under power, pulled the power, my nose was up. You know, and they said, okay, you know, now don't do it again. Right. And the point is, <laughs> the, the point is, um, you know, have you learned your lesson? You know, so one is. Uh, deconstruct the facts. But two is even more important is the emotional awareness. All right. Are you aware? And if you are, what are you going to do to correct that? So the, the idea is the correction. And the idea is never go low. So I remember Elsos had told me low means you don't let the airplane go below the glide slope. Well, I've been told that, but you know, you can go a little low and it's no big deal. Well, guess what? It is a big deal. And so okay. um, I took that to heart and, uh, and I never went low again. And ended up doing fine. So the key is learning. That's so that's the first thing. But the second thing is what you asked is more, I think, more critical. And that's getting control of your emotions. And that's hard. I'll yeah. just be straight with you, right? You know, so um, the way you do that is through, and by the way, I do meditate. I think there's this visualization. There's this ability to focus your mind. Um, you got to be able to calm your mind when there's chaos all around you business, by the way, right? And so there's there's some really powerful skills and techniques. Um, uh, I talk about triggers, you know, having triggers before you go out there, visualization. Um, I visualize it going well, by the way, not it going bad. Um, and, uh, you know, we know this in sports, We there, there's really powerful techniques. So I would do those techniques. And I would, I still do this today, every time before I speak, even though I've done a thousand speeches, I will go through my exact speech, line by line, by the way, thought by thought in my head. And that's what we do on the Blue Angels. We go through the exact sequence uh, uh, by exact cadence of the airplanes. Uh, we're even talking about the communication and you ingraining into your brain. You actually are changing the neurons in your brain. And we know this mm-hmm. now through science. So that's, that's what I did. 
And then what it was what was it like um, going out to the plane the next day? Where you did you have a, a bunch of anxiety and just kind of forcing yourself through it, or were you ready? Uh, it varied. You- yeah, there was anxiety, you know. Um, yeah. But I also knew. A, I knew I had training. I knew you mentioned this before, by the way. There's a good support team around there. Uh, I knew I yeah. could do it. So it, what you have to do is is actually get over your own anxiety. Is a good word. Um, the fun part. You know, so the answer to your question is the um, that night after debrief, and I went to the the dirty shirts wardroom. That's where you the pilots eat, and I had a big double cheeseburger with fries because you know <laughs> you're not you're not going to die from cholesterol at that point. I said if I die from that or cancer, I'm lucky. <laughs> Right. You know, so, uh, you know, I kind of gorged out. And then uh, the next day, what the problem is, you know, sleep. And can you block that out of your mind? Because that's all you think about. Right. So I've learned to compartmentalize. And that's to take these instances and, and you don't do away with them. But I put them in what I call the back of your head. Right. And it's same thing in business. Right. When you have a challenge, let's say you have a relationship that's not going well. You know, you got to be able to compartmentalize it at certain mm-hmm. times. Right. And then you got to bring it up to your consciousness. And, uh, and then you're going to work on it, right? So the point is, um, I'm pretty good at compartmentalization, which, by the way, is not always great for relationships. But um, you got you to be <laughs> smart about this, right? Um, but anyhow, um, I, and then I went through the landings so many times in my mind. And then when I'm, when I'm coming down the chute uh, that next night, uh, what I realized, and this was maybe an aha that hopefully would be helpful for the listeners, is I realized that the airplane didn't care. So you said you walked out to the airplane. You know, it's a physical street, right? It doesn't know if I'm scared. The airplane doesn't know if it's bad weather. The airplane doesn't know if the deck's pitching or not. Uh, It doesn't know it's nighttime or daytime. It's going to fly the way it's flown. And, and so this, the, the skill is get, get control of yourself. And I realized I went, holy cow, you know, I just got to stick to my procedures. I got to stick to my training. Um, I just need to control my own mind. And that's the key. Where did you pick up meditation? Was it in when you were in the military? No, it's it's after after the military. In the military, um, in in the active duty, not the Blue Angel side. Blue Angels are active duty, but it's a very special kind of elite um, group. Uh, I never, you know, used meditation, never even used visualization. It was never taught to me. You know, as a kid, uh, did I visualize? Yeah, you know, we all have dreams, um, you know, playing football. I visualize that kind of stuff. But it was never taught to me. When I got to the Blue Angels, within the first time, it was actually part of the core discipline of the way we, we as an organization did things. And before we went flying, we would always have a brief. Now, in the military, the briefs are usually pretty, um, they're very structured and, you know, okay, where's the safety obstacles? What's our objective? How are we going to do this? Boom, boom, boom. And the Blue Angels, we did that, of course. But then we went into something much different. And that was this actual re- recitation or cadence of what we were going to do. And I've got video of this where we're going, we're, we're, we're walking through our maneuvers. Sometimes we call it chair flying. And I, I'm actually feeling the cockpit. I know what it feels like in there. I'm, I'm, I'm visualizing those three inches on that other airplane. I know what it's like, with, what it feels like when the G-force comes off and I'm upside down hanging in my straps. I mean, I, I'm going through that and I, I go through it at such a precise way that by the time I climb into that cockpit, it's easy. I just have to mm-hmm. execute, right? And um, so, we never used meditation there. We used visualization. When I got out right. of the military is where I got exposed um, through uh, mostly my wife, uh, meditation. And now for the last 20 years, uh, I you know, deeply see the, the parallel between focusing yeah. your mind and meditation. It's huge. What's the, what type of meditation do you practice? I got you know? tons. So um, I got a good friend of mine named Michael Roach. If anybody should look him up on this book called The Diamond Cutter. Uh, he teaches, he's a, he's a Buddhist uh, geshe, which means, you know, he, he understands Eastern wisdom. But he's a, he's a Westerner, right? And he teaches Eastern um, uh, wisdom for really business success, right? Anyhow, um, the, uh, the key there was, you know, many different types. I, I start every morning with my glad to be here, wake up. It's a meditation to me, and it's a, it's a meditation on gratefulness and gratitude. Here's what I do. Everyone can do this in a second. Very first thing I do when I wake up is I just say, what am I grateful for in the present moment? That's the key. So today was easy. I'm actually in Sun Valley. That's where I live. And I, I woke up. It's a beautiful day here. Um, and I'm saying, you know, uh, I'm just healthy. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Life is great. I have a great business, a great relationship. Everything's going really well. I'm like, I'm grateful for that. Okay. Then I said that, and this is the key though. I go back 24 hours every day and I say, what happened yesterday? 
Did I have something to be grateful for? So for me, I was with my team. I've been gone for six weeks. I was with my team. And you said, you know, we were having a team meeting right before you and I talked. I got a great team, you know, and we were going through catching up after six weeks. Where are we? Where are we trying to go? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, I was grateful for each and every person on my team. Uh, then here's what you do, though. This is really critical. Go forward in your day. And this is what I try to do. And I think about others, not just yourself. So today you came into my mind and I said, you know, I'm going to have the rare privilege to speak with, with Chris and, and maybe we'll be able to, to support or help somebody else out there listening. And I was just thankful for this opportunity. Turns out I do that every day. Turns out if you do that and we don't know how long, we really don't know how long it, it it takes to form a habit. You know, there's all these numbers out there, but it depends on the complexity of what you're doing. Um, but if you do that, you know, you all know Hebb's law. You'll change the neurons that are in your brain and you'll start to have more grateful, happy thoughts. So that's one meditation I do every day. Do you do, do you meditate just once every day? Well, it varies, right? I, I, I do different mm -hmm. types of meditation. So I try to do it in the morning. This morning we did a chakra meditation where I'm, and I'm meditating on different energy centers in my body. Um, um, actually, I have a very um, disciplined routine that I do in the mornings. And part of that is calming the mind. Uh, sometimes it's meditating. Sometimes it's, it's sitting outside when it's peaceful and just uh, in quietness, uh, more visualizing, right? Um, uh, do many different, I do problem solving meditations when I have a, a business challenge. I'll, I'll, there's a technique that I use for that. Um, uh, many different, many different ones um, that I've been using. We, we we talk a lot with our clients and the people we work with and on the podcast about, you know, you mentioned neuroscience, but also uh, the idea of flow state yeah. and getting into the zone, right? Yeah. Um, we recently interviewed um, Stephen Kotler, who's the author of The Rise of Superman, who interviewed all these um, high performance athletes and they hooked their brains up to what was actually happening to them when they're doing, you know, jumping the Great Wall of China on a skateboard and cool things like that. Yeah. And right. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sure I, 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 you've know a lot about this because you're flying, you know, three feet away at a thousand miles per hour from your buddy upside down and you have got to be extremely focused. Yeah. Um, do you have any, any tips or thoughts on how, uh, what you learned from the Blue Angels on how to get into a flow state to be more focused and, and produce better results? Yeah, well, uh, I, two things hit me. One is, you know, how do you get into it? So that is what we, we would call the brief, and it would be about an hour and 15 minutes before we were going to execute whatever event. I teach this to all kinds of sports teams. Um, back when we were going to, NFL, the Major League Baseball, Joe Toy brought me in. I mean, we, we speak to, you know, Nick, Nick Saban had me into Alabama. We won the national championship a few years ago. So the, the key is this, it's the preparation side. So what, what I heard you say or ask the question is there's the preparation side of, of getting ready. This is not about planning. This is about preparing your mind, right? So we would do that about an hour and 15 minutes before we would go flying. We went through this cadence. It's an emotional, but also a, a, a visual. And uh, uh, I would close my eyes. I'd move my hands. You know, I, I became, uh, I became one with the jet, right? So the jet became me. There's no separation. Now that's fine. That's preparation. There's a bigger skill. And that's what I call dynamic focus. And that is, how do you stay in the zone when you're actually executing? Okay, and this is hard. You know, this is very hard for athletes. You know, how do you stay uh, in the zone for 60 minutes of the game? the whole way, mm -hmm. not be distracted by the audience, right? Which I have been, I've been distracted all the time when I played ball. Um, so there, there's a way to, to do that. And what I call is dynamic focus is what I learned when I was flying with the blues. Now, no one ever taught me this. I learned this afterwards. I, what I've been doing is, is deconstructing because I was put in this incredible experience. An example, so we mentioned it earlier. Uh, you're coming at each other, you're six miles apart. Thumper and I, okay, two opposing solos. Coming at each other at 1,000 miles per hour closer. Every nine seconds, we're both doing a mile on the ground, right? So four and a half seconds, we're closing. Um, what I have is some checkpoints. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, it, it's sequential. I'm hitting a checkpoint, and I'm, I'm, and I'm checking. Am I early? Am I late? And I'm making adjustments. What most people don't realize is this is a constant state of adjustment. Flow is not just sitting there. It's adjusting, mm -hmm. right? So then, but here's the real key, is now I got to pick up the jet. So at two miles out, uh, that jet looks like a dot. Okay, because it's coming straight at you. It's coming at right. you, you know, like I said, a, a mile every four and a half seconds. So you got to be able to focus in on that dot and then 
you actually have to open up. And here's, here's what the skill that I learned. You focus down, you open up. You focus down, you open up. Because I got to see, is there a tree in my way? Is there a sailboat mast in my way? Boom, where's the jet? What's his nose attitude? Oh, I got to open up. Where's my teammates? Boom. So it's this constant state in our, our brains, we think in frames anyhow, of opening up and focusing down. And you can do that 65 times a second, by the way. Um, and once you get really skilled at that, that allows you to maintain the focus and situational awareness that I think is critical, not just for the high performance athlete, but it's critical in business, it's critical in life. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you were going to form a new habit, John, um, something you wanted to do or create in your life, what was the, what's the process that you would use to make sure that habit gets ingrained yeah. and is effective as quickly as possible? The very first most important one is, is your belief. Uh, you have to set an intention that, um, and you have to believe your intention. So um, I think there's four steps. So I'll give it to you right now. So the first is, you know, it's, it's the old, you know, why, you know, so why am I doing this? But what's my belief around? It, okay. Um, do I believe this is possible? Because we have limiting and liberating beliefs. So I, I walk through a four step process, which by the way, I use for entrepreneurs to grow their businesses. This isn't just about creating a new habit, right? You can, you can do this in a small way or you can expand this. Um, so first thing I wanna focus on is my belief. If it's a limiting belief, I usually find out it's fear-based. So I gotta, I gotta counter that. I gotta turn limiting to liberating beliefs. Uh, and I gotta believe it. It's the same thing when I climbed in that cockpit. Could I improve my performance 300%? The answer was yes, but I needed a whole lot of help. And yeah, there better be a structure. And that's the second piece. So the first piece is you really got to set your own beliefs and you got to be honest with yourself because you cannot lie to yourself. Right now, we all have these beliefs in our heads and we know when, uh, what's holding us back and also what's liberating us. Second is now you got to make it um, more of a structural approach. So I call that the brief and that's what we already talked a lot about, this ability to focus. So get it down to something that's simple and something that's repeatable. So if you want a new habit, let's make it simple and repeatable. So for us, that would fall under uh, a briefing every morning, okay? Second, or the third piece is you got to actually go do it, all right? And a lot of people spend so much time thinking about stuff, they don't actually do it. So I'm actually executing. I'm out there, I'm executing, and, it, and as I'm executing on this habit, let's say, you know, it's to work out more or whatever. Uh, in this case, let's say it's to grow your business. I'm saying, okay, well, what is the piece that we thought about what we're working on? Uh, let's try it. And now here's the fourth piece, and this is the most critical. And I've mentioned it a bunch of times, but it's it's now you better reassess and you better have a feedback loop. I call that a debrief. So now I'm, I'm constantly reassessing. That will allow me to reset my beliefs. And now I get a spiraling up process of high performance. I call that the fearless success system. It's in the book. And it's a process that you can apply to creating a new habit. It's a process you can apply to a relationship. It's a process you can apply to a, a new business. What do you What do you do to keep? It's amazing. Your energy level is amazing, by the way. <laughs> um, and I know people that you know, even when they hit their thirties or late twenties, they start to struggle with energy levels. Um, and this is something I'm always examining, you know, as much as possible because it seems like every month there's new research that comes out about this. So, you know, and you, especially when people hit their 30s, late 30s or 40s or 50s or, or 60s, you know, they're, they're, you know, they just, they just, they, they kind of give up. They say, oh, by default, I'm older, so my energy is going to be lower. But you've got a, a lot of energy. So what are the things that you do to keep your energy levels high and how do you maintain that? You know, I'm so glad you asked that because it to me it's natural, all right. Um, but now you know you're, you're making me unpack it. Um, I mm -hmm. think the most critical element, and I think where our energy comes from, is a purpose larger than self. I think you absolutely have to have this purpose larger than self. Um, to me, that's what we talked about on the blues being an ambassador. Now it's impacting people's lives around the world. You know, we fortunately have impacted over a million people. And now with this podcast, it's going to be even more. Um, but the idea is it's, it can't be about you, right? So my energy comes from waking up going, I've got something important to do today. And it involves others, not just myself. So I think that's number one. Number two is that, uh, you, you know, you got to have a way to do it, right? So um, for, for me right now, uh, you know, we have this amazing business where we get to work with top CEOs around the world. Uh, we get to meet people like you, Chris. We get to talk to people who are out there on the cutting edge. That's a privilege. So I, I, I constantly remind myself 
to be grateful for those opportunities. So that glad to be here wake up is critical. And it's not just wake up, do it you know, throughout the day. It's critical to maintain your energy state, especially when you're mad and angry and frustrated. It's so easy to get in that downward spiral. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I check myself. I say, wait a minute, okay. Um, but what am I grateful for? There, there, you know, there's a reason. And usually every challenge is, is something that's gonna make me grow anyhow. So um, I actually embrace challenges now. Now it sucks when you're in them, but what the heck, you know, just, just go do it. So um, it, it's this ability to be grateful. And then the other element is of course, I think there's a physical side, right? So that's the mental side of, of, of it. But I, I try to eat well, I, I don't always. Um, uh, my wife again helps me with that. You know, I had a nice green smoothie this morning, um, <laughs> but I had a steak last night. So it varies, right? But the point is that I try to eat well. I definitely need to get outside. That's one of the reasons we live in Sun Valley. It's not about just exercise, but it's about getting into nature. I just uh, this morning took a long hike right out our back door. We got 368,000 acres. Now we only own one of them. The rest is wilderness. And uh, <laughs> and I went I went on a hike. You know, out my back, and there's so much, I mean, nature's amazing right now. It's springtime, it's green, stuff's coming out. Um, I, I tried to do something physical last night, and when I got home, I jumped on my bike and rode my bike out my back gate, and same kind of thing, right? So the key is trying to find a physical, a mental, but I really think that emotional state, that a state of, of, of generosity, uh, we started the Glad to Be Your Foundation. Uh, I give 10% of all my fees to charity. I, did, I started that about 10 years ago. We've now been able to impact 337 organizations around the world, hundreds of thousands of people, $1.8 million. And that's just from, um, from the revenue that comes into us. I just say, hey, and then I tell my clients, you know, you're probably out there doing some great work. Where do you want half of this money to go? And we send money all around the world. And it's amazing. Uh, when you come and you find how many people are doing good things out there. And that to me that, is, I think, what's creating the energy. That's really, really cool. Now, you talk about four simple words that change the way you perceive the world. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to hear what those are because that sounds like a super hack that, that I can apply in life and uh, make a huge difference. All right, so here they are. Okay. Glad to be here. And glad to be here. I started my talk. If you remember when, you know, go back in the beginning of this podcast, I said glad to be here and I told you it means something different. I'm, I'm glad you asked the question. Uh, yeah. they're, they're not just four simple words. They, they did and changed my life and I think can change anybody's life. It depends what you put around those words, right? So for me, it's living in a state of appreciation and gratefulness. It isn't just fluffy, right? It means go out there and do something. Go out there and make an impact. Go out there and be grateful for all the opportunities. So for me, glad to be here is I'm grateful for the opportunities I have in life. I'm grateful for the people, my team members, the people I get to interact with. Uh, and then, of course, you know, I'm grateful for, you know, my health in this case. Or, or But it's all about others. And uh, that, to me, when you really embed that into where it becomes not just a saying, it actually becomes the way you see the world. So I'm constantly looking at the world as magical. I'm constantly looking at the world as this is incredible. And all of a sudden, uh, things will change all around you. The way you see the world will change, but here's even more important. The way the world sees you will change. And in fact, on that, I'll send you a, a sticker. We're trying to start a movement, by the way, of gratefulness. And so at all my talks, I hand out these glad to be here stickers. You'll see them. And you go to our social media, our website. You'll see stickers on people's phones, computers. I got them on race cars. Um, you know, just the message of being grateful and appreciating your life and helping others is taken off. John, one thing that, that I'm impressed with that I've talked with a lot of people, once they have their entrepreneurial career or success, they, they really want to go around and inspire people and share their story and, and create a professional speaking career. And you've spoke with over a thousand organizations. I think you're doing over a hundred a year or around a hundred, yeah. hundred presentations a year. Yeah. Which is one every uh, 3.65 days. Usually and about three or for a week because uh, you don't yeah. got the weekends, but go ahead. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a couple of things I want to, uh, I'd like to know, how, how do you get tied in with uh, a group of speakers to get in the circuit? Because I've found that um, quite often it's, uh, and, and I want to say click, clicky in a bad way because clicks are good 
also. Um, but you know, it's like there's a network there and how do you break into that network to get more speaking gigs? And then how do you structure it in a way where it becomes a profitable business? Yeah, no, great question. Um, I think the first answer applies to not just speaking. It's really anything that you want to do in your life. If you want something, let's say you want to start a speaking career, I would say find someone else who wants a similar thing and help that person achieve mm -hmm. what they want. So I'm happy to, on this podcast and anytime, help people uh, become the speaking world. The, the, the way, I guess the best way to share it is, I'll just give you my experience. There's multiple paths up any mountain, right? So um, this is only one path. But the way it worked for me was I had no intention to be a speaker, okay? Uh, I had started a, a different entrepreneurial company. It's called Centerpoint Entertainment. We're going to be the NASCAR of aviation. Uh, Red Bull, by the way, is doing it right now. You've probably seen the Red Bull air races out there. Uh -huh, yeah. uh, but I, I tried to start that in uh, 2001. And, uh, you know, I had venture, I was, I used to be a VC. I said I had venture capital backing. I had, um, uh, well, all the funding came from me, but, uh, the point is I was in at New York on, uh, closing an equity deal with ESPN on the day of nine 11, which became very oh, wow. meaningful, uh, deeply for so many people around this world and this country. Uh, and I saw the towers come down and, and I remember running towards them, not away from them, trying to see what I could do to help people. And, uh, there was nothing. There's nothing you could do. I yeah. remember running, going in to try to get blood at the hospital and uh, all the surgeons and medical people were standing around and they wouldn't even take my blood because they're like, we don't need any, you know? And I'm like, wow. And I, I just was working with Patrick O'Shaughnessy uh, with Catholic Health Systems, uh, which uh, in New Long Island, he was there at that day. It was crazy. I was just, I just met him two weeks ago. He was actually standing there. We hadn't seen each other for, um, you know, years. But my point is that, um, that business blew up that day, right? But it changed other people's lives in a much deeper way. Uh, so you just reinvent yourself, right? And, and in that reinvention, I uh, was at an event for personal growth. I'm always trying to get better. And uh, someone was using and uh, talking about visualization, but more from the psychological standpoint. And they knew I was in the audience and said, hey, do you mind saying a few words? And I said, yeah, no problem. But instead of talking about the psychology, what I said was, well, this is how we used it. I think that's what became evident in this podcast, right? I was just trying to be from a practical standpoint. Here's how to use it. And the light bulb went off that day. High performance teams, how to determine business results. I know how to do that, right? And mm -hmm. so I, I, I said, well, shoot, let's, let's first come up with what's the message. So I think anybody who wants to, uh, to speak, first off, you know, what's your message? Think about it. Um, make sure it's your message. Make sure it's real to you, all right? I, I talk about myself and my experiences. I, I don't talk about others. And, and I say, you know, and then, then the key is, you know, give value, right? We say that all the time, but is there something that, that you've experienced, and everybody has this, that's valuable to somebody else, you know? Find those, those things that, are, that you're passionate about, too. So the whole point is, yeah, you got to craft your message. And then there's a business side to it, and that was the second part of your question is a lot of people have great messages and have done amazing things. Um, there's thousands of people that want to be out there on the speaker circuit. Um, how do you actually break through? Well, for me, uh, it was by chance. Uh, I got my one opportunity. I was skiing here in Sun Valley, happened to meet a, a, a national head of sales of a, of a large insurance organization. It took me, you know, three months to convince the guy to give me a shot. It was like 20 people in Quarter Lane. Uh, and he said, you know, I'll, I'll see what they said because I don't care what you say. I want to know what the audience says. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it went okay. And then from that one, from that one opportunity, then I put the business model into place, which is get the testimonial, create a video that shows what you're doing, that shows the impact of not only you to the audience, right? And, uh, and that turned into 20 gigs with that one company. Then, of course, uh, it was financial services. I started to get exposed to that industry. Next thing I know, I'm being exposed to multiple industries. Uh, I remember initially, I, I thought the speaker bureaus were the way to go. So I reached out to a bunch of them, and they're like, who are you? You know, and, and, uh, and they're right. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that they already have in their quiver. So they're not interested necessarily in someone who hasn't proved themselves. So I'd say go out there and prove yourself. And then once you've proved it through the client's eyes, not through your eyes, um, then what happens is uh, people start asking for you. And now all the bureaus, you know, we have like, I think, 48 bureaus that represent us now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, 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 it changes, right? But I would, I, so, that, so I guess to wrap up, that first statement I made is the most critical. Um, find someone else and help them. 
And it doesn't have to be in speaking. You know, someone who's trying to start a business, help them with the skills that you have, whatever those are. And I guarantee you, you watch people start helping you. Absolutely. I, I firmly believe in that and something that, that we like to practice quite often. Um, the thing, too, when you do that, it's great because it gets you out of your own head and it really gets you in a giving state of mind and helps you. Like anytime I'm in a funk, I realize if I go do some form of giving, it gets me out of that funk. And it's, it's such a powerful practice, you know. Um, one thing I'm curious about, John, is is how do you determine your worth as a speaker? Not like personally, but say uh, monetary wise. Say I'm I'm worth X amount, ten thousand dollars. There's speakers now. I mean, I'm blown away. It's like forty thousand dollars for them to show up. Sixty thousand um, dollars. How do you how do you how would you how did you guys do it? How do you measure like okay, I'm worth X amount, and uh, this is what you guys have to pay me to show up. Well, again, it, it doesn't matter what you think. It's what the person who hiring you thinks, right? So mm -hmm. great question. Um, and for me, it was a pecking order, right? So, you know, you just got to get your name out there. I think the first speech I gave was 6K. I may even be 4,500. I can't remember. Um, and, uh, you know, I always try not to give speeches for free. It's one of those classic, you know, chicken and the egg thing. Uh, but you got to get exposure, but also, you know, you're worth something, right? So right. my point is that there's a lot of speeches less than 10,000. I mean, there's, there's tons of events out there. There's tons of organizations, there's usually smaller, who, um, who need somebody uh, at less than that. But here's the key. It's not what you think. It's again, you know, what, what is, what a clients think. So, um, that's what I found was just getting out there. I found very quickly, if you have a powerful message, uh, I use a lot of video in my messages, by the way, video that, that I'm in flying, um, that I license and I own. And, and that's the kind of stuff that I think creates that excitement. And then, um, it's more about, be, you know, becoming a master at your craft, right? So like I said, I've done over a thousand of these, a thousand organizations, and I'm learning every day. I'm just trying to make my speech one sentence better than the night before, one, one thing better. So it's a constant improvement process. And from a monetary standpoint, uh, I find there's a big, you know, you can get up to like 12 pretty quickly, 15 and below seems to be a breaking point. Um, then the next breaking point is 25 and below. So getting from 15 to 25, once you hit 15, I went to 18, that didn't matter. You know, I said, well, go to 25. So there's this gap from 15 to 25. Um, and then the gap, you know, you mentioned it is, is about 25 to 40. And, uh, and then anything over 40, typically is more of a celebrity status. It's, it's not so much right. what you know, but it, it, is there a name? So uh, yeah, so we're, we're in the high 30s. We're, we're 37,000 now. And uh, it took me a while to get there. It's a, it's a total pecking order. Uh, but it's, uh, it's learning and it's creating that value and giving it back to your, your organization. John, I like to, we're going to wrap things up, but I like to ask the guest, do you have any secret projects that we're working on? Because I come across a lot of amazing people and talk to amazing people. Um, and of course, the listeners are out there. Anything that uh, you, that we could do to support you or have any big projects coming up or uh, type of people that you're looking for that we could connect you with? Anything in, in that realm that, that you'd like to share with us? Oh, what a, what a great question. Uh, absolutely. Uh, our, our major, our mission is to inspire a billion people, right? So I want to impact a billion people. And what we're trying to do is figure out what's the best way to do that. Currently, it's through these uh, business audiences, but uh, we're looking to grow into the B2C marketplace. We're actually, I'm looking for a business manager right now, someone who's done that, right? And, and or is very passionate about growing this business. We have a tremendous B2B business. We're, 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 we're working, you know, deeply with some companies. We do full on leadership consulting. Uh, we also, you know, but we're trying to grow into that B2C side. So that's mm -hmm. why you, even there being helpful. We're creating a product. Uh, we should have it out here in about six months. It'll be the first ever digital product on the fearless success system. So that's something that I want to, uh, we're about halfway through the project right now, but I want to get out there in the world because I want to see how that impacts individuals because I know that it impacts teams and organizations. We know that. So it's actually we're reverse engineering the harder stuff, which is organizational transformational change and, and turning into more of the individual. Um, so that's what we're doing. We're also trying to grow the glad to be here message uh, worldwide. Uh, and the foundation is just one piece of that. But for, for us, it's making a difference in other people's lives 
And, uh, you know, the new book's just out. I mean, that Fearless Success book's only been out a couple months. Uh, of course, you can get it at Barnes and & Nobles and Amazon and, and all the airports. But uh, we got something special. If you go to our website. Uh, we bundled it in with another book that I call Breaking Belief Barriers. So special for pe- listeners that want to go directly to the website. That's johnfoleyinc.com, johnfoleyinc.com. Uh, but more importantly, you know, uh, I would say just go make a difference in someone else's life. That, to me, is the best way you could help. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I'm, I'm actually going to download that book as soon as you inspired me by the stories and the mentality that you use. And so uh, I'm going to download that on my Kindle as soon as we wrap up here. John, I'm incredibly grateful and glad that you're here and uh, happy, so happy that you came on the show and very happy that we had, that you accepted the invitation to come on the show. Thank you for sharing all your tips and tricks and wisdom with us, your story with us. It was incredibly inspiring. I'm sure we could go on for another hour and a half, Um, but thank you so much, John. Thanks for being here. Chris, thank you. And thanks for what you are doing for all your listeners and for so many people. It's been an honor and I'm glad to be here. We're going to wrap up there, listeners. Thank you guys for tuning in once again, and we'll see you on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Hey, listeners. Thanks for joining us once again. We wanted to remind you about our high-performance productivity coaching and our five, six, seven, and eight-figure private masterminds. These are all designed for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs to help you scale rapidly and grow. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com. That's thebusinessmethod.com. And... We'll see you all on the next episode.